So, we're going to talk today about the Network of Networks SOPs uh, version 7 launch. Um, I'm going to go through, it's not going to be a very traditional SOP launch because basically um, it's up to you to decide which SOPs are applicable to your clinic. And because we have a different way of working in BC now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the background of Network of Networks. I'm going to talk about the SOPs themselves, uh, how to access them, how to train, and also uh, what the big changes are from versions 6 to 7. How many in the people, people in the room right now are using those SOPs, the, the N2 SOPs? Okay, good. So not too many, good. Okay, so I wanted to really start out with talking about the network of networks. And the reason I want to talk about it is because we have our colleagues joining us from the interior. Uh, there's a group from CFRI and also from Northern Health. And for the first time in British Columbian history, there actually is a network of networks membership for everyone in, in, in the province. So uh, the BC Spore Support Unit is very kindly paid for a membership for everyone for the year. So that's everybody that's working in academic research has access to all the N2 resources. And I wanted to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank them. I've been involved with N2 since the beginning uh, in 2004, and I'm on the board of N2. I'm the secretary to the executive committee. But it's been really great to have a provincial membership at this point uh, Quebec, so FRQS, all of the sites that they oversee or the groups that they administer, they have a membership in Quebec. Saskatchewan has a membership through their support unit, their SPORE support unit, and now uh, BC does. Alberta has almost every single person that's involved in academic research uh, with a membership, but because they have two medical schools, it was a little harder to have one provincial membership. But, I mean, we're very thankful for this, to the support unit for providing this membership. And I wanted to just make sure that everybody here, and I won't take a lot of time before we get into the SOPs, is completely aware of all the different resources that you can access through N2. These slides will be available to you. And also there's a recording of this session. So if you want somebody else to see it at some point, they'll all be available and you can have the recording. So N2 itself um, is a very grassroots organization. Started in 2004, and it was really coffee between Linda and Karen. Um, they were both leaders, or the, basically the operational leaders of, of different research networks. And they got to the point where everybody was doing their own training, and they thought, well, this is crazy. Why reinvent the wheel? Why don't we all do the same training? Because it doesn't matter what therapeutic area you're working in you're still going to do the same kind of GCP or you need SOPs. So everything is similar irregardless of what the therapeutic area is that's, that you're working in. So they decided to contact the research networks across Canada and we just happened to be contacted because uh, the Canadian HIV Trials Network has been around for a long time and they did a Google search of, well it was probably before Google searches, they did a search of all the networks. And so there were seven networks that met originally in Toronto. And essentially, we talked about the different resources that we were all using in common. So we wanted to work together on GCP training, standard operating procedures, other tools and training. We knew there was other things, but really GCP was the major one that was the driving force because at the time, everybody was doing their GCP training at investigator meetings or they were using the U.S. version of the city courses and there was really nothing available for Canadians. And also there was real will uh, to have a Canadian collaboration. And I'm not going to go through all these in depth because they're quite long. So we started the, the GCP certification program online in 2008. And that's how we got to use the city platform, the CITI platform. It's from the University of Miami. And they also had a similar... Uh, need in the U.S. Because, the, because OHRP had decided very quickly that the Americans also needed training. And so this was a very, again, a grassroots group that came together at the University of Miami and said, we need online training for all of these investigators who are working across the U.S. So they had created this platform, and a few of the people that were involved with N2 had already used that platform. So we contacted them, and they were more than happy to take us on. There are several other countries that are on the, the city platform as well. So 
Canada's the largest non-U.S. country, but there's Korea, Japan, there's all kinds of different countries using the city platform. We also really wanted to have um, SOPs because everybody was quite frustrated and I remember working at the CTN many years ago and we had a group of us that worked on our SOPs for our group. We were sponsoring many trials and it took us two years to do the SOPs. It was a long process because you're all busy working and you're trying to do things off the side of your desk. We put together a committee and we, we worked on them and got it done and then at the same time the N2 SOPs came up. So the real driver behind the N2 SOPs was to basically not make sure everybody in the country is not wasting their time rewriting SOPs when we're all doing the same kind of work that are, we need to adhere to the same regulations. Um, you can look at all these. This is sort of the background of N2. Uh, right now in 2017, actually, we have 127 members. So we're quite a large group of people across Canada. We have... Um, Health Canada, and I'm going to talk a little bit coming up, they're going to be doing some consultations. So we're going to be doing consultations with Health Canada as they come up to, to deal with some of the changes to the regulations. But the only reason they come to us is because we kind of represent the biggest group of, of investigators and research sites across Canada. So N2 basically at this point encompasses research networks, universities, um, health authorities, can anybody and everybody that's working in research or clinical trials research specifically. We do have a community investigator membership, so we do have community investigators as well. So there's different kinds of memberships. And it's a really, if you have the chance, I would highly recommend that you go to the annual conference at some point because it's a great group to go to. There's usually about 150 people. It's in Toronto, and it's kind of the, the best way to meet as many people as possible to make your life easier because you always have somebody to call to get resources from or somebody that has the same problem that you're having in, in the research world. We do have uh, MOUs with different groups and I just wanted to mention Healthcare Can because Healthcare Can is, is the umbrella organization for the VPs of research across Canada. So we've done a lot of advocacy work with the VPs of research because we wanted to make sure the VPs across the country know that we're here and the resources are available in their institutions, but they've also really been great advocates on our behalf as well when they're, they're talking to different people in Ottawa. There's our mission and vision. And our strategic initiatives. And here's really what N2 is at its core. So N2 is always was, for many years, a group of volunteers that worked together to produce tools. Um, as I said, the first two that came out were the GCP, and that's under education, and SOPs. Here's the other committees that are around. I'm going to talk a little bit about each committee and what they contribute to N2. And then the board of directors, so there's two of us now from B BC, there used to be three. We've always been really well represented uh, in N2 because we've been involved since the very beginning. There's our new website. We finally updated our website, so it's fantastic. It looks a lot better than it did. And it's just n2canada.ca. You can link in there and, and look. You can't, unless you talk to your administrator, you can't get into the resources. You have to have a password to get in. Some of these slides are hard to see with the white wording. Okay, member resources. We're going to talk about SOPs, so I'm not going to go into that. The education committee. So this is by and large the largest committee. These are the group that drive the, the GCP course. When you go online to the city online courses, you'll see a whole selection of different courses that are available. So other than GCP, we talked a little bit this morning uh, in one session about the Division 5 training, which is very applicable to clinical trials. I've had investigators take it and they liked it, so that was a good thing, but it, it's really useful for clinical trials regulations. Here's all the different modules that are available. Uh, so if you have staff or you know somebody that's starting out in research, a lot of these modules are really useful, so the, the responsible conduct of research is a really valuable tool to give you a background in research. Depending on the kind of research you're doing, so basic biomedical or social behavioral research, uh, you'd have a look at those. 
Uh, the transportation of dangerous goods, this is one of the ones that's used quite often because then all the institutions used to pay separately for their, for their training, so now it's online and it's available to you to use, so you don't have to pay separately. It's not as in-depth a course as you would get if, if you were doing the in-person training, of course, but it's, it, it's enough for what's required now for, for transporting dangerous goods. Uh, Division 5, we talked about um, the newest project that has been released is a privacy course. And because the privacy legislation is different in each province, and it's different within academic institutions versus private industry, it's not a really super in-depth course. It's not meant to replace what you're doing in your own institution. Everybody still needs to take their own institutional privacy course. But if you have somebody that wants to generally understand the, uh, the privacy requirements across Canada, this is a good overview course. Um, and I wanted to let you know what's coming up. Um, Leslie, who's sitting here, she's a senior project manager for the CTN. She's leading the clinical research coordinator training course. So the City US had an online course for coordinator training. Uh, we decided to take it and we're Canadianizing it right now. Hopefully it'll be ready in the fall, uh, probably I would say October, November, realistically. And again, it's a tool that you can use. Um, it's set up, the US version and our version is really set up for somebody that has done some work in research, but needs to know a little bit, understand a little bit more what the coordinator role encompasses and what they need to do. If they need more basic background, they would go into the RCR course. Is that the right one? The biomedical course. So both the RCR and the biomedical course will walk you a little through the background of why we, why we are where we are with the regulations and what the requirements are and what you need to understand. So you can use them all together depending on the training requirement for the person that you're training or if you want more information. There also is a biosafety course coming. I don't know as much about this. Have you heard much about it? I know it's coming, but... Um, it will be released and we'll let you know. Here's the usage as up, up to September or November 2016. Um, I had asked, but I hadn't received it in time, a slide that shows us the number of people in BC because I'm very interested to see. There are, last year when I looked at it, there was about 5,000 users in BC for the GCP course. It would be interesting to see when we have a provincial membership how the numbers change, if they change a lot, or there's a lot of people that already have the training, so they're not going to take the GCP course, obviously, again. Uh, we'll see a lot more of a spike in the GCP refresher course at some point. But that gives you a rough number. So there's been quite a large number of Canadians trained using the city courses available to N2. We've talked a lot in N2, so the education committee is really focused on the online courses because that's really what the demand has been. Most people want to have access to something that they can do as they have time. So we've been talking a lot over the years about doing other kinds of education. So we have done one regional meeting here in BC. Uh, Quebec is doing a regional meeting this year, and we wanted to start to have regional meetings where we could have some information in the morning and then in-person training in the afternoon. So we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Um, also, we have other courses. There are webinars that are offered occasionally. So Health Canada had an update to one of the, so for example, Vanessa's Law, if you've heard of Vanessa's Law. We did an update with Health Canada about that. So we tend to just do the webinars ad hoc, but if you have an idea for something that you would like to see as a webinar, just let me know and we can certainly work with you to, to make it happen. They're, we're pretty open. Most of our stuff is still driven by volunteers. We do have some staff now, but we're happy to, to accommodate as many people as possible. The Clinical Trial Education and Awareness Committee Chair is Stefania. So many of you will know Stefania from VCH. Um, many years ago, this was the recruitment uh, committee and we decided to switch gears with the recruitment committee. We really wanted to focus more on patients. Uh, we do have a large number of patient advocacy groups that are members of N2 and we wanted to make sure that there was somewhere there was a voice where they were being heard through N2. So that was really the driver behind this and of course there always is the hope that we're going to get more recruitment by, by approaching patients and having that input up front. So really it was this resource that has been, again, a driver behind this committee 
the It Starts With Me campaign. It's an online, you can certainly use it if you have ethics approval in the hospital to use it. And uh, it really gives you the voice of research from the patient perspective, why it's interesting to be in research, what it brings to the patient. We just wanted to make sure there was something out there that was more of a, a public announcement of what research is and what it brings to the Canadian landscape. And it was a really controversial video when we first released it because there's a group of people in N2 that work in research ethics and there's a group of people that work in operations. Those are kind of the biggest two groups. And some people really were unhappy with the wording and the way that it was presented, but it was really, this is the patient voice. This is what they wanted. We received a CIHR grant to do this and this is what they said they wanted to hear. So, so far so good. We've been using it in a number of, of centers across Canada. Here's another really good one to know about, the quality committee. So if you're interested in, in having better quality within your research sites and centers, this is the group that you want to get in touch with. We do have an informal list of people that ask each other questions and talk. I think that this committee has uh, been very invaluable to Leslie and I because we had approached them when we were getting a Health Canada inspection several years ago, and they provided us with um, a lot of mentoring because they had been through several, most of the members of the committee go through Health Canada inspections on a regular basis. One of the me members works in pediatrics, so they get Health Canada inspections in their network every week because every drug for pediatrics is, is an experimental drug, so they see a large number of, of Health Canada inspections. But uh, Susanna and Sandia, who are the, the co-chairs, they're both from Toronto, and Susanna's at um, Princess Margaret and Sandia's at CAMH. They also both see a large number of, of clinical trial inspections. There are all kinds of resources for you, from everything from how to educate the staff about an inspection to signs for doors, how to book rooms, how to interact with the inspector, questions they could ask you. So if you have any questions about that, you can talk to Leslie or I or anybody really that is involved with N2. We can point you in that direction. But Really wanted to emphasize that if you think you're going to get a Health Canada inspection or you're getting one, don't go through it alone. There's lots of help and people that are happy to talk to you and help you through it. There are some, oh, I should go back. There's some other quality assurance tools as well. So if you're trying to develop a quality program, and this is something I'm going to talk about in a little bit. This is something that's really being pushed now by the new regulations that are coming. So quality is something that they're emphasizing. <gasps> So you might want to start pulling out some of the quality tools and seeing how you can implement them in your site. There is a metrics committee. We do have webinars. They're going to be released very shortly as well. So if you're interested in how to best go about designing metrics for your specific center so you can keep track of things, this is a really great set of webinars to take. There's three of them. Um, we had worked with the Metrics Consortium in the U.S. I had been a member for a year when I worked at the Rick Hansen Institute. I found it very useful, but completely overwhelming. There's so much there. There's these huge process maps and dictionaries and things that were too much for me to use. I needed, we needed some basic metrics to keep track of. So we decided that we would work with them and, and move it to a point where we could start walking people through a set of webinars where if they wanted to collect metrics, there was sort of a how-to guide of how to start collecting metrics. There is the communications committee. This has been one of the biggest challenges that we've had as a volunteer organization is making sure the information gets out. N2 as a membership organization has one administrator for each member if that administrative person isn't really good at communicating in their institution, not a lot of information has gone out to some of the institutions. So we put a real effort in and have actually hired a, 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 a communications consultant to come in and help us with a better communications plan so that everybody that's a member of N2 will have no problem knowing what they're involved in, what they can access, and then how to find it in their institution. There is a pediatric interest group. Um, they've never been a full committee because they kind of do the work as they need to. I know that they're working on pediatric assent consent forms right now. Um, it is a large group of people that were working in pediatrics, so if you have interest in, in anything like that, please let us know and 
you're, you're more than welcome to join any of these committees if you have time and inclination to, to join them. And then there's the contact information for us. So I put my email in there. The person that you want to write down if you ever have a question is Shelly. Shelly's our, our person that works for N2. She works full time. She's our project manager. She will connect everybody and triage your questions to whoever they need to go to. Okay, SOPs. Yay. <laughs> I know it's hard to present SOPs because it's not the most exciting topic in the entire world. It's something that's necessary. So just to let you know, the N2 SOP committee, it is a large group of people from across Canada. They have been at it now. This is version 7 that we're talking about today. So it's been going on for 14 years of SOPs. They do change. So what they do is they have the committee meet on a regular basis. Anything feedback that they receive, they look at it. So they keep track of all the feedback that comes in. They incorporate it as they can into the next version. Um, they meet on a regular basis. They, we do have several kinds of SOPs, so mostly today we're talking about clinical research SOPs and investigator-initiated studies, but also there are um, research ethic board SOPs that are available that were developed in collaboration with CARIB, and also there are biospecimen SOPs that are available through OICR, so the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. So if you need any of those SOPs, you're more than free to use them. Um, we've talked a little bit over the years about having pharmacy SOPs, and that could be another set that could be added, but again, that would be more driven by the pharmacists that are involved in research, so we've been working with them to see if that's what they want to do, if they want to have those SOPs. And basically, the reason for having SOPs is so that you know your site staff and yourselves have a certain standard of working and it's compliant with the regulations. Um, the nice thing about the N2 as well reduces, I love, I love jokes, so I'm going to put something in there. But basically that's the point of N2, reduce burden. So version 7 um, does reflect the clinical trial regulatory environment in Canada but it's also applicable to US FDA regulated studies, so it adheres to both. It's reviewed by a compliance person to make sure that it adheres to everything as it is at the time it's released. So as of May 15th, it was current. There's uh, all the references there that we go to, so the regular stuff, Division 5, uh, natural health products is kind of a newer part. We hadn't had that in previous years, so we're happy to have that. Uh, medical device regulations are in there. And, of course, uh, GCP. We're working towards, in BC, I've been asked to see if we can kind of parcel out the parts of N2 that are useful to people that are working in clinical trials, so under the regulated environment, and then also the group of people that are doing all the other research studies that aren't regulated by Health Canada, but still have some basic requirements that they should adhere to or could adhere to if they had the tools available. So we're going to be working on that and having a webinar to talk a little bit more about what's available to non-clinical trialists. What would you want to have as, as a group to, to have access to? So that will come. There is a revision summary uh, of each of the SOPs. It's at the back of the SOP. We've pulled them all out and put them together. If for some reason you want to see all the changes from version 6 to version 7, a lot of them are administrative changes, so I, I had it pulled out. It's 12 pages long. It's not necessarily the most exciting document to read, so I didn't want to go through it in like page by page today. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the version 6 to version 7. So other than administrative changes, the real driver this time, so we do revise them every two years, but the real driver is the, the upcoming changes that are going to happen with Health Canada. So how many of you know that the ICH GCP guidelines had a revision? So some of you. So there has been, for the first time since 1996, the ICH GCP uh, guidelines that everybody uses so as the basis of the law in most of the countries, all the ICH countries, uh, have had a revision. The revision isn't... Um, it's some changes, but it's also additions. So there's 26 new parts that have been added to GCP. 
The driver behind this version of SOPs is to be compliant with the new ICHGCP, excuse me, changes. When you get a copy of these slides, there's links in there if you want to have a look. Uh, Health Canada couldn't adhere to the, the changes right away, so their, their goal is April 1st, 2018. When we rewrote the SOPs this time, the person who was the chair of the committee for the GCP, uh, well, the GCP committee for ICH, she's a Canadian. Actually, she lives in, in Vancouver, Jean Smart. So we've asked her to be involved in the SOP revision. So everything is already adheres to the revision before it's happened, or the, the, the ICH GCP changes before they are adopted by Health Canada. There's a, a link there too, so you can see what the, the new version is. The other thing I wanted to mention too is Health Canada. Uh, we had another session this morning, talked a little bit. It is the world's, world's worst website that you can possibly imagine to find things. They are transitioning to the Canada.ca um, URL. I don't know what that's going to mean. I don't. Hopefully, it means that it's a little more organized and easier to use. But we'll see. Apparently, all the links will still exist for the next little while, so hopefully they'll, they're live for a bit because I think everybody's bookmarked their links once they found them. Okay, version 7. So I talked a little bit about why there's the changes, and this is a sort of a bigger change than we've had in past years because it's the first time that the GCP uh, guidelines have been updated. The effective date on the SOPs is May 15th because they have to pick one date to put on there as the version. So what we ask everybody to do when they start using them is to write a note to file to, ex to explain the effective date at your site. So all you have to do is put a note to file on the front to say these are effective as of whatever date at your site. Um, probably best to do the effective date after you've trained people, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about training too. If you would like it, the compliance letter is available that you can append to the, uh, to the SOPs. Um, when you're doing training, so there's going to be a real emphasis, I'm going to talk a little bit about this coming up, on training. Um, you want to make sure, and I've been in this situation where people have these SOPs in a binder, there's no evidence that they were ever trained on them. So you have to have evidence that you yourself or your staff are trained on the SOPs. So there's really two different ways. You can decide to do the training through quizzes, and there's two quizzes available. There's a, a quiz that has questions, uh, no justification in it, and you just get the answer. You get your staff to fill it out and see if, if they are trained on that SOP, and then there's the answer key that will go with it. Or there's another way to do it, which also satisfies Health Canada. You can use a training page. I don't know how well you can see this. We decided to, Leslie created this, but it's basically to give you the option of using which SOPs are, are relevant to you in your center and if they're applicable or not applicable, and then sign off at the bottom that you've been trained on them. So this will be available to you to use for training purposes. So we can't go through the SOPs one by one because we would be here for 10 years, but also it's, it's not necessarily, each one is not applicable to every, every situation. We want you to make sure um, that you have a formal set of SOPs because it actually is required and especially now required under ICH GCP revision two. You have to have some kind of procedure in place in your center. Um, we release them only as PDF documents at this point. So there's been an ongoing debate over the years. What do you do with these SOPs if they're not totally relevant to you and your center? So some of the centers have taken them, they have a working group, and they revise them. Some of the other centers accept them as they are, which is the PDF document. And I would really uh, hope that you could have work instruction guidelines. And the work instruction guidelines are more of the how do you actually do it in your own center? So just keep in mind that the SOPs are how you um, follow regulations as they are. They're very general. If you need something more specific, create your work instruction guidelines. Do not put them in your SOP binder. Put them somewhere else because if you get a Health Canada inspection, you're not an, under any obligation to provide them to the inspector. And if you do provide them to the inspector, then they, they'll make sure that you're following each of those instructions to the rule. So. You want to make sure that you keep yourself some options that you're not doing things that you're not adhering to in your own guidelines. 
Um, if you want any help with work instruction guidelines, we can certainly kind of point you in the right direction, but it's really the hands-on day-to-day, what you're doing, how you do it, how you log into your computer systems, the very like nitty-gritty parts of your research site. Access, I just had to put this in, it's a disclaimer. Access is pretty, it's for everybody in this room. Um, please don't share it with people outside of academic institutions in BC. I can give you a list of who's a member, but it's basically all the universities, PHSA, all the health authorities. So it covers almost all of us, but it's not for people working in industry because they do have their own SOPs. And we've chosen to keep it uh, more of a closed loop than opening it up to everybody everywhere across Canada. Here's how you access it, access the, the new version of the SOPs at Providence. So you can either use either the generic um, contact uh, emails, which is for PHCRI or CHAOS, or you can contact either Julie, Leslie, or myself at any time. We are happy to provide you to the link. They are available in a password-protected site. So we would send you the login information. You can go in and pull them out. You, um, generally, what we do with any of the SO or any of the N2 tools, we pull them out, we put them in a site that people in the institution can use. Um, very few people actually can log into the N2 website because they're because of membership issues, essentially, that everybody could go in and get whatever resources they want. So here we are. I've got copies of the table of contents. It's a two-sided document. So as you go back to your, your workspace, you want to have a look at this table of contents, and you're going to have to decide which ones are applicable to your specific organization. We, um, I mean, there's some of them that are applicable to everybody, so of course you're going to have the, the SOP overview document, which is O1. O2, um, research team roles and responsibilities, you're going to have that one. Research team training. So see, these are some of the ones that have seen really large changes to them from the previous version because of the, the changes that are coming to ICHGCP or have happened and will be adopted. Uh, the protocol feasibility and site selection, that's kind of, you have to decide, the feasibility is good. If you're not working as kind of the sponsor person, you're not going to be involved in the site selection. So you take the parts that you need. Um, study initiation activation will be applicable in most cases. Consent it will be, this is a general overview of consent principles. This isn't how you do consent at your own site. That's always going to be driven by your ethics board and their policies. So this is an addendum to the ethics board's policies. Uh, research ethics boards, this is again general, how do you keep track of what's going on? You need to keep track of all the communications that are going back and forth. And again, it isn't the policies and procedures of the REB that are in here. The informed consent process, so again, the general principles behind it that are driven within the different uh, regulatory documents. Recruitment and, and screening, and again, that will depend on your specific, oh, oh, it's turned on, that's okay. Um, recruitment and screening, again, this is something that will be driven by the policies and procedures of the institution. Biological specimen and investigational products, so if you're working in um, device for example, device trials, you're not going to need this investigational product SOP, so you can choose not to use it. Uh, specimen, most of us are collecting biological specimen in our studies, so you probably will. SAE, 
uh, reporting. This is one of the ones that Health Canada looks for when they come for an inspection. They have sort of this top list of five SOPs that they look for to make sure that your site is doing it. Uh, SAEs is one. They, what are the other ones? Uh, informed consent. Uh, delegation. delegation. Investigational product. Oh, training. Yes, training's a big one. Yeah. So maybe you should say it into the mic so everybody can hear it. I'm just going yes. Uh, informed consent process. Um, the ones that I had asked for, I like just said that was informed consent, record retention, investigational product, research team training, and delegation. So those are the ones that were really important and have been traditionally with Health Canada. Um, the other ones, they like to see that you have processes in place and they want some training on the processes, but there's a few that they're really specific on. Um, monitoring communication. So a lot of these SOPs, so if, you, if you're working in non-clinical, non-regulated clinical trials, you're not going to have a study monitor coming in. So again, it's not going to be applicable to you. But it, it talks about the communication process of, of what happens when the monitor comes, what you need to keep track of, what you need to do as a site. Uh, data management, that's pretty much across the board for every study. There's some kind of data management involved, so that's a good one to have. Investigator study files and, and essential documents, very specific to clinical trials because there is a list in the ICH guidelines that has what you need as essential documents. Some of the documents, um, as we move to more towards having a list that's available for non-clinical trials, some of them are still applicable. You're going to want to have a delegation log. That's one of the ones that everybody's trying to work towards. So at least if you're working in a site that has, for example, a lot of students working on projects, you want to know who is doing what and when and what they were obligated to do. So it's good to keep track of that because if you have to go back in the records, uh, you at least know who was involved at the time. Uh, study closeout, uh, that one is pretty specific to clinical trials, audits and inspections. Clinical trial applications, so if you're a site that's doing a lot of studies, um, uh, pharma studies, or you're doing a lot of studies that are investigator initiated but you're not the sponsor, you're not going to need this because you're not going to be filing a clinical trial application. It's, it's the sponsor that will file it for drugs. Uh, confidentiality and privacy. Again, this is, mirrors what's available in the online course. It's, it's a generic overview of privacy and confidentiality. It's not specific to the institution. And the newer one that's been added is clinical trial applications uh, for natural health products. Where for a number of years, we had a number of members of N2 that felt left out because they do a lot of natural health product uh, trials, and there was really no kind of SOP specific to them, so that's available in there. And uh, device studies, the information for device studies, so there's an SOP specific to that. So if you're a group that's only doing device studies, you're going to, again, pick and choose what you want. Equipment calibration and maintenance, that was one of the ones that Health Canada has looked for. This has, I think, been the bane of the existence of every clinical trial site in Canada uh, for many years. And I, I don't know if it's going to change. I'll tell you about the changes at Health Canada that might change some of this. But the inspectors were looking for equipment calibration for any of the, any of the uh, tools, for example, a blood pressure cuff, a uh, scale, some kind of pump, anything that you were using within a clinical trial, within a regulated clinical trial. They wanted the calibration documents for that equipment. Because most of us, especially everybody in this room, we work in an institution, you make the assumption that the institution has equipment that they're maintaining and calibrating. Um, that wasn't enough for the inspectors. So there's been a big push over the last few years for calibration outside of the regular biomedical calibration that's done in the hospitals. So we'll see how that kind of plays out over the next little while. Here's ones that are, are specific to investigator-initiated studies. So this is if you're the sponsor of an investigator-initiated study and you need some SOPs to help you get going. So designing CRFs, analysis and reporting, protocol document development, 
data management plan, database setup, a lot of it on database you can see. So if you are doing other kinds of studies and you want something more about databases, this is a good way to, to look at and have an SOP. Uh, this is again a group of SOPs that have been driven by Health Canada inspections because they've asked for many years for validation documents when they've been doing their, their um, inspections. And a lot of people, especially in investigator-initiated studies, would go, what is a validation document? And unfortunately, Health Canada has never had good guidance on validation documents, so many of us default to the U.S. regulations, which are more than fine in this case, but when you're in the middle of having an inspection and they're asking you for the validation documents and you're, you're struggling as to what they want, it, it's not a fun situation to be in. So I think there's going to, I know there's going to be a little more guidance around that coming up. And then there's just a glossary of terms. I mean, it's not an SOP, but it's in there. So that everybody's using the same terms because probably when we say study, everybody in this room has a different idea of what a study is and what a trial is and what a, there's many different meanings. So I talked a little bit about the changes as I went through. Again, here is the link to the R2 editions. Um, and all the changes are documented on the back. So for some reason, you're looking at an SOP and you want to know what was the change in that specific SOP. The documentation is there on the back of the SOP. So really, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the R2 addendum, just so you understand what the big changes are that are coming. Um, so why? I mean, 1996 is a really long time ago now. Uh, there's been a lot that's happened over the last 20-some years in clinical research. As I said, there's 26 additions. So they haven't taken anything out. They've added some parts to it. And the real response was modernization. So everybody wants to do things electronically. Uh, there wasn't really good guidance electronically in any of the countries. I think probably the Americans and the Europeans have been the leaders in that, of how to deal with electronic databases. But it also integrates all of this global regulatory feedback for the last 20 years. So all of the different countries involved in ICH have had inspections in their countries. And there's common areas that they keep seeing. So they've incorporated some of that into the new R2 uh, revision. And there's more changes to come. Actually, all of the ICH documents, if you ever go into their website and look, there, there's a lot of changes that are happening. They're updating a lot of this stuff because it's been around for quite a while now. So the E6 general considerations for clinical trials has just been released. So it gives you sort of an overview of what you should be doing as an ICH group of people working in an ICH country in clinical trials. The multi-regional clinical trials, this is kind of a newer one because now almost every single trial you're involved in is multi-regional, multinational, multi-something. So it's going to be adopted this year. They're going to do an update. So how is this going to affect you in particular? So as I already said, April 1st, 2018, Canadians are going to be expected to adhere to the R2 revision. And the funny part right now is because different countries have adopted this at different times, if you're doing a multi-center clinical trial, you might have a sponsor that's working under R2 and Canada is not. So they might be asking you to do things. You start saying, well, why are you asking me to do this? It's not something we've done before. But it's just because they're, especially the pharmaceutical sponsors, are on top of what the changes are going to be. And they're starting to work that way already. Having said that, though, the FDA hasn't approved it yet either. So, um, The biggest change, actually, and it's a, this is a good change, investigator oversight. It's a common inspection finding everywhere in the world for the last 20 years. The investigator is supposed to have ultimate responsibility of what's happening at their site. And really, this is the first time they've gone further to, to say that, yes, this, this one person, there's one person who has responsibility for everything at this site. You can certainly delegate different tasks, but ultimately they still have the responsibility. Down to the fact that the investigator is responsible for what's happening in the pharmacy, what the CRO is doing if you're a sponsor investigator. They have to understand it, all parts of the study and what's happening, depending on what their role is as the sponsor or either just an investigator. Here's some of the new additions. I'm not going to read through them, but 
The one that's really interesting, and it's come up perpetually in Health Canada inspections, is training. Investigators are required now under the new revision to hire staff and train them before they start on the trial. So you cannot work on a trial that you haven't been trained on the protocol. You haven't been trained appropriately for the task that you've been delegated. You don't have the appropriate certifications or whatever is required. If, for example, if you're a nurse and you, there's nursing duties required in the study and you're doing nursing duties and you're not a nurse, it's the investigator's responsibility to hire the right staff and to train them. And that's very well spelled out in this document. Um, SOPs. So there's always been this interest for the regulatory groups looking at SOPs. They want to know what you're doing and what your processes are. It's actually spelled out now. You need some kind of process and procedure in place. Delegation of EDC. So EDC is really the big addition to this, this version and to make sure that this is documented. Who has access and what the access is and, and how you do it. Uh, procedures and workflows. So they even want workflows of... If you're doing an, a study in a hospital and you're working in outside departments that are not your own, they want to know what the workflow is in those departments. Uh, study meetings. So everybody does have some kind of research meeting in their, in their organization or their site. You have to document it. And a documentation could be as simple as there's points on a board and somebody takes a picture of it and you know what you've done. And you, but the best thing to do is have a sign-off sheet. So you have an agenda. You talk about whatever it is, minutes are preferred, and then everybody that's being trained, if you're being trained in a sort of a group session, sign that they've been there and they're trained. So each person has to sign themselves that they've done the training. Uh, so any kind of documentation of study meetings, as I said. Uh, communication. You can't include text messaging in communication. It's been the one thing that's been not included. So. There's no good way for regulatory authorities to keep track of um, text messaging, so they've excluded that. But anything you're doing by email, email trains are fantastic. Um, email trails are fantastic because you can do, see a lot of information in one document, and I think probably almost everybody uses email as their kind of documentation system at this point. Delegation logs are key. They're in the regulations now. You have to have a list of who's doing what, when they started, when they were trained, and, and how long they've been involved. And if they leave, it needs to be updated. So it has to be done in real time. There's some new requirements for sponsors. So as I said before, quality management systems. Uh, it's never been something that's been spelled out in detail in, in the uh, ICH guidelines. So... You're going to see things coming from sponsors if you're doing a lot of industry trials called a quality management system or risk, management, risk man management education. There's going to be sort of different quality parts that you're going to see. I think each sponsor will interpret this differently and decide to implement it in a different way. But there's a lot of information about quality and risk. Uh, documentation. So they've made documentation more stringent because this has always been the perpetual finding on inspections. There's not enough documentation. Probably most sponsors are going to do, start doing good documentation practice training so you know what you need to document. And this will apply to everything. So if it's basically it's the same old adage. If you haven't seen it and it's, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. You have to have some kind of documentation of, of the processes and everything that's happening. Monitoring plans, this is the first time monitoring plans are in the GCP guidelines. They're really based on risk, so it, it's kind of a good thing for many groups, especially in Canada where we've always defaulted to doing annual monitoring, if nothing else, so you can do risk-based monitoring now. So there's some trials that you're involved in where you're using a, a drug that's approved for another indication, you know what the side effects are, it's not incredibly risky, it's not a new drug. Um, they would see, those kind of trials will see less monitoring. And there's more availability to do um, monitoring remotely because they know that it's too hard to be able to go out to the site every time. So everybody's working on EDC systems by and large, so you can go in and do some internal monitoring and checks on the data remotely. You probably will start seeing, and this is kind of the biggest change I can think of too, is training on risk management. 
So we've never really dealt with risk management very well in Canada. I know some of the other countries have, but really what is the risk in the, the study and at, at all different levels of the study? Um, so the, the inspectors were looking at monitoring plans for the first time. So that would be interesting to see how that goes. Electronic systems. So there's really a lot more information in this, this revision about electronic systems, particularly wording around validation. Validation has been this kind of thing in Canada that nobody knew what to do about. So it'll be good, I think, to have some more direct information about validation the other one that's been a funny one that's come up in the Health Canada inspections is certified copies. So in the records of most clinical trials, if you're using paper forms, there's all these pieces of paper in there. The inspector looks at them and they have no idea who's copied it, if it is an original and true copy of what you photocopied it from. So certified copies could be something as simple as when you photocopy it, you sign and date that it's a certified copy from the original that you photocopied it from. Some organizations are using stamps. Um, they're certainly easier when you're using something electronically because there's an audit trail so you know that it's a, a certified version. So that's something else you'll probably start seeing from the sponsors. And I just wanted to give you a quick update about Health Canada itself. So they've, they're undergoing a reorganization. It actually happened last year. So the very strange part about the Health Canada Inspectorate was all the inspectors you can see across the country, they're the stars. They each had as their supervisor their regional director. So each of the regions was not connected to the other in the inspection program. So you had the inspector in, in Ottawa, but they had no oversight over the inspectors. So it was a kind of a bizarre situation. So they've certainly changed that. The, the new manager is Chad Sheehy, and we've got the new supervisor, Rick. So he will oversee all the inspectors. So we're really hoping that across the country this now harmonizes what the inspectors are doing. Because the biggest complaint over the years is if you're doing a multi-center study across Canada, one inspector in one province will look at one thing and somebody else in another province has a different set of, a different way to interpret the regulations. We've asked to hopefully see what their SOP is on how they train the inspectors so we can see if there's some kind of standardized fashion that they're being trained. But we're really hoping this will change the differences across Canada. So this has been a big change. In fact, all of Health Canada has been completely reorganized. So poor Chad, he works, he's the national manager of the inspectorate. That's his half-time job. So I think they've taken a bunch of different divisions and they've basically made a bunch of people managers of two different divisions. They've renamed them to a certain degree. I have a big listing of all the changes if anybody's interested. So hopefully it'll little, be a little bit um, easier to deal with the inspectors now. They're going to come out and start speaking, as I said. They want to hear feedback. They need to make changes to the, the law in Canada, actually, because Vanessa's law is changes that are going to affect clinical trials, and they need to be in on our regulations. And all the new ICHR2 changes need to be incorporated. So they'll be coming out for consultation. I don't know how they're going to do it yet, but we'll see. And they, there's a new kind of atmosphere in, in Ottawa of being open and being available, wanting to hear from Canadians, wanting to, to be involved in what's going on. For a number of years, if you've been doing a lot of clinical trials, you know that Health Canada was kind of a shut door. You didn't quite know what was happening. So it's, it's a change and it's nice. Um, and that's kind of it. I have certainly more slides than any of these parts that we've talked about. I didn't really want to go into great detail. And I really wanted to have, engage in a conversation about SOPs if you have questions about them and sort of how to use them and what you think you should use in your own centre. So thanks very much. And I'd ask that you use the, the microphone in front of you to ask questions in the audience here. I just have a, a question uh, in a um, practical question. How to do training with this stuff? So how do you recommend to do it? So group I, training? you can do group training. You can do individual. So the training, if you have each person read the SOP and sign that training log, so far with Health Canada, that's enough. Just documentation that they've read it, when they've read it, and that they've been trained on it. 
I think group training is better just because, I mean, in research, you're working as a group anyway, so it doesn't make sense to do things in isolation. So you would want to probably pick, I don't know, one or two or three, do them as a lunch and learn maybe over a lunch hour, talk through them, talk through what's in there versus what's happening in your site and how you want to deal with that. You can certainly, if you really want to change the SOPs, you just would have to take, put a sort of a note to file as to what you've changed in them. If you want to keep it as an SOP, that's why I was hoping people would use work instruction guidelines because it's not something you're going to be inspected on. So I don't know who else is, who's done SOP training here. It's, it's not the fun, the fun job to do, but it's something you have to do. One thing I've done in the past is got together with a couple of other groups, and everybody takes a couple of SOPs and you just go through it, and it's much more interactive and fun than doing <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh, you guys are quiet. I'm kind of oh, good. Um, for, um, training. Yep. Uh, what I did is. I had a slide, um, a PowerPoint presentation, and I shared it with the um, dietitian board. So I did it as a self training and then uh, a self Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's totally acceptable. Leslie has a, a good documentation practice PowerPoint presentation she's done before, too. So I think we'll see more of those, but self training is fine. As long as it's, there's a signature that says they've been trained. And the same thing with the sponsor community about if we have a new investigator for sure. And the mm -hmm. lives that have a really different schedule. So it's really important to have that sponsor community and have that sponsor. The only one I would suggest that you can't do self-training on in that regard would be the protocol. So the inspector will look to make sure that every, especially the, the COIs, are trained on the protocol. They should do that with the principal investigator at the site. It should be a one-on-one -on -one training. What about the amendment? It depends on how major the amendment is. So if it's a big, like if the protocol dramatically changes, they'll still want to see that the, the principal investigator is training, the, is particularly the investigators on that change. So you're better to default. If they can do it in, like if, you're, if your clinic has research meetings, you can do it in that kind of venue. You can do the training there. You just have to make sure that everybody signs that they've done the training. So it's really important that those co-investigators, whoever's being trained on the protocol, signs that they've been trained on it. Yeah. So SOP is site-specific or study-specific? I mean, it's a study. Well, I think what I always look at is SOPs are specific to regulations. Um, the study kind of manual should be what you're falling back on for your particular study. So there should be some kind of operations manual or something that tells you sort of the how to do this particular study because the SOP is not going to do that. So it's really like more construction. Yep. Studies, basically. basically, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, if you're a group that's doing five or six clinical trials, you're going to have some kind of operations manual or some specific training manual or some kind of person that's going to train you on each particular uh, study. The SOPs would be generic across all the studies. Hi. Um, I know from this list of SOPs, there's system set up or system backup. Yeah. SOPs now, are those specific to the IT? Department? And well, yes, department. if they're delegated to do it. Right. They have to be on the delegation log. Okay. But it's still ultimately the, the principal investigator that's responsible for making sure that it's happening. Okay. Yeah. Anybody on uh, the f uh, video have a question? All right. Well, you know what? If You know how to get in touch with us if you have questions. There's certainly a ton of people with a ton of experience in clinical trials uh, if you need more guidance on clinical trials because it's not the most straightforward process. Um, but certainly get in touch with us if you have any questions. We're always happy to triage you to the right person if we're not the right people. So thank you very much for coming. I really hope you can take the SOPs that are applicable to you, do your training, Get them implemented and, and you'll be good to go. So thanks very much for coming today.